So, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daniel O'Neill. I'm the chair of the Hila Sealy Committee this bar year. Uh, so we have two very quick announcements for Hila. Uh, first, we want to just let you know that the next Sealy we have coming up on November 9th is about advising small businesses. Uh, that's going to be part one of a two-part series. This, the second part is going to be in February. Uh, as you all may know, our HILA president this year is really focusing on solos and small firms. So these are fantastic topics to really kind of expand beyond some of the offerings you might have seen from us. So we're really excited about bringing some of those topics this far year. And then second, uh, we, we just want to give you a quick reminder about our evening with the judiciary. That's one of HILA's signature events, and that's taking place on October 28th at the Grove. Uh, and since that one's in person, if you all are eligible for the booster shot, you might want to get that uh, over the next day or two and be able to join us. So we're looking forward to seeing you all out there. Uh, so the topic that we're here about is a very, very important topic. Uh, if you all are out on your own, this is one way to go from good to great and even better as a lawyer. Uh, if you're in larger firms like I've worked in, this is an invaluable skill to have, uh, and it'll help bring you billable hours and really help your reputation around the firm that you're the person to go to for this kind of help. Uh, just the other day, one of the partners came to me and asked for help on something like this, and, and that's, I'm, that's great for billable hours, and it's great for getting to meet different partners. Um, so, I mean, no matter what practice area you're in, communicating effectively is very important. So we're grateful to have somebody here today who has a passion for this and uh, is out there trying to help every, every law student, young lawyer, be the best version of themselves. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Professor Lauren Simpson. She is a clinical associate professor in lawyering skills and strategies. Uh, she earned her BA in French and International Studies at Washington University in St. Louis in 1988. She's a proud graduate of the University of Houston Law Center uh, from 94. Uh, after practicing in civil litigation, she transitioned to the first court of appeals uh, in early 1997, serving as a staff attorney there for more than 13 years. Professor Simpson eagerly accepted a faculty position at the Law Center in 2010 and is now a clinical associate professor teaching lawyering skills and strategies. She is a spring 2016 recipient of the University of Houston Teaching Excellence Award in the instructor slash clinical category. One of three 2018 AALS Teachers of the Year selected by the Law Center and the 2017, 2018, and 2021 Student Bar Association Professor of the Year for Law Center faculty teaching in the part-time program, as well as the co-recipient for 2019. So thank you so much, Professor Simpson. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Daniel. So I really wanna thank Hyla for inviting me to come speak to you about one of my passions something near and dear to my heart, which is writing effectively and persuasively to make the life of the court and staff attorneys and law clerks easier and at the same time advocate the most effectively that we can for our clients. Uh, I wanna in particular thank Daniel O'Neill for reaching out to me and working out all the details and for Lucy fisher Kane for helping move things along as well and for suggesting that I speak. So I wanna I want say thank you on that. So I'm gonna share my screen. And I have a little PowerPoint here that I'm gonna run. I hope everyone can see it. Okay, so I described this as standing out from the pack. And I can tell you from my experience at the Court of Appeals, most briefs were solid briefs, but there was that cream of the, of the crop, right? That little percentage at the very top that just stood a shoulder's length above um, other briefs. And, they, they apply these types of techniques that we're gonna talk about today among others. Um, so rhetorical devices and organizational devices to help advocate subtly for their client. And so um, as Daniel intimated, we definitely want to try and reach that level of writing to make the life of the court easier. So I would if we divide this talk into its components, it would be Standing up from the pack in two ways. The first is what I like to call connecting the dots for the judge, and I'll explain that more later. And the second is what I like to call maximizing moments of persuasion. So let's begin the begin, as they say, and talk about connecting the dots for the judge. Okay, so what I mean when I say connect the dots is to make connections in your argument to save the court time and effort, all right? 
being helpful to the busy judge, especially at trial level, but also at appellate, and or their staff attorneys and clerks is a huge part of persuasion. Um, I like to say to my students, always and in all ways, connect the dots for the reader. So there are different ways that we do this, but the bottom line is we want to make sure that we don't skip any steps in our analysis, in, you know, in our uh, statement of the rules, in our paragraphs, so that the reader very quickly sees how one sentence connects to the next. So I'd say there are three areas that are of most importance in my mind, and I'm going to talk about those today, although there are many ways to connect the dots. The first is to make sure we use the precise and key language in our uh, governing rule in our analysis. The second is to use repetition purposefully, and I'll give you an example of one rhetorical device that does that. And the final one, and this is the most important, I saved the best for last, is to use thesis sentences and not topic sentences. Okay, so first let's talk about using the key rule language in our analysis. So here we see an example of a rule from a statute. And so it talks about what constitutes a close relationship. Within the language of the rule, it has specific words. And notice how the writer on the left has literally used the exact language from one of the elements or components of the legal test. On the right side, what you'll see is that someone used an approximation. So son, daughter, right, offspring. Um, either a synonym for it or just sort of a different thing that's in the category, but not the precise word. So here's the thing. Whatever element or factor or component of your legal test is key for that particular analysis, absolutely ensure that you use that precise word in at least the conclusions based on the evidence that you talk about in your motion or your brief. This is a way of implicitly connecting the dots because there's not that split second disconnect between the word that you use in your conclusion and the word in the statutory element. Instead, it is absolutely clear how you fulfill that element, if you're the proponent of the motion or the appellant, or how, you, how the other side has failed to do it if you are the non-movement or the appellant. So this is actually a pretty simple thing to do, but it's really easy to forget it. So I uh, like to suggest to my students that they actually make a checklist and look for literally the same word in their conclusions. So let's talk about using repetition purposely. And let me just sort of as a backstory here say, you heard from my introduction that um, I was a liberal arts dual major. So repeating words in my writing in undergrad was anathema, right? I lived with a thesaurus next to me, although these days it's thesaurus.com. Um, the thing is that legal writing is a hybrid of that kind of prose and technical writing. And at its heart, it's technical writing. Therefore, clarity, structure, and organization are highly prized, okay? One way that we're clear is to use the same word to mean the same thing throughout the document. And so I'm not an opponent of synonyms in certain places, but using the same word consistently actually is a blessing for those reading a long brief or a motion. So I'm gonna show you one rhetorical device that uses repetition purposefully. There are endless examples, but I'm gonna show you this one. There's actually a word for this in rhetoric, in formal rhetoric, but I've always called it the looping back technique. So what you see here is a sample from the summary judgment standard in any generic MSJ motion. And if you look sentence by sentence, I've color coded, what appears in the middle or the end usually of the prior sentence is repeated near the start of the next sentence, almost verbatim in each case. So traditional summary judgment is proper only if there is no genuine issue of material fact to determine if there is a genuine issue of material fact, right? What this does is implicitly move the reader forward through the paragraph by using that looping back technique. You don't need to do this in every rule statement and you don't need to do it in every analytical paragraph, but it sure can be helpful, can't it? And what the reader sees implicitly between the lines is, okay, we're going from the more general to the more specific and fleshing it out. Does that make sense? So we are connecting the dots for the reader implicitly. 
this is the it, this is the thing that I want you to hear today. So let's talk about thesis sentences. And let's compare to them to the topic sentences about which we all learned when we were in grade school or grammar school, however it was called. So as we say in the South, bless his heart, a topic sentence has one job, y'all, just one job. And that one job is to tell us the topic of what's going to follow in that paragraph. But a topic sentence doesn't necessarily, depending on how we craft it, transition us into that topic from what it came before. And it doesn't necessarily connect that topic in the paragraph to the progression of the argument supporting our thesis. And in law, when we're writing for a court especially, we have a thesis, right? We have a thing of which we want to persuade the judge. Let's contrast a topic sentence with a thesis sentence. A thesis sentence does at least two things. It does everything a topic sentence does. So it tells you what the topic of the paragraph will be, but it goes beyond that it somehow gets across to the reader how that topic that's coming up fits into the overall progression of the argument, of the thesis. So is it, for example, a topic that's going to be a counter argument? Is it a topic that's going to be an illustration of something that you said before? Is it part two of three parts that together when added together equal the disposition in your client's favor? It functions as a transition that moves the reader along. So a picture's worth a thousand words, and I thought I would show you the difference between the two. Take a moment to scan the screen. Okay, what you see on the left-hand side is an example of a topic sentence. So this is, we can imagine, in um, an Appleese brief, right? Um, so, or, or in a defendant's brief, or, you know, responding to a motion of some kind by the state, I'm just making this up here, um, but talking about what's gonna come up in the paragraph. So on the left, we know that the state has a responsive argument. Okay, this may be a, re a reply, for example. But we don't know how that fits into the overall thesis that the state should lose on its motion because it hasn't carried its burden. On the right-hand side, we know precisely not only what the topic is, but how that fits into our overarching thesis. And here's the test for whether your paragraphs, well, let me back up. Every single paragraph in the analysis portion of your motion or brief, so not necessarily the rule statements, but every single paragraph in your analysis should lead with a thesis sentence. And here's the test to see if you have thesis sentences instead of topic sentences. When you're done writing and you're in the editing phase, Highlight the first sentence of every paragraph in your discussion section. Go back to the first of those highlighted paragraphs, reading them sequentially and reading only the highlighted first sentence, you should be able to, to, to follow the substantive flow of your argument in support of your thesis. If instead you have a bunch of disjointed topics, then you have topic sentences and not thesis sentences. I do this with every document that I write. I make sure that I have a thesis sentence that moves along to the next step, clearly the argument in support of my client's position, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna talk about that second area, which is standing out from the pack by maximizing moments of persuasion. And let me just say here that we have time to talk about only a few, and I'm primarily gonna focus on techniques. But I would say that every part of a motion and every part of an appellate brief that can be a moment of persuasion should be a moment of subtle persuasion. It's argument to a court and not to a jury, but nonetheless, they are human beings and they are persuaded subtly. In a motion, this includes the introduction. This includes the headings. If you have a longer motion, for example, some federal courts, uh, trial courts do require headings, for example. Um, this is in how you phrase your rule statement. The rule of law is, is accurate, 100%, good and bad law, but it's not neutrally phrased. You should be able to look at it and instantly know whether it was one side or the other that wrote the, the law while also being complete. Your statement of facts, no argument, but how you organize it, and we'll see an example later, is a moment of persuasion. And the equivalents in the appellate brief are the same as well. So 
Everything that can be a moment of persuasion, not just your analysis portions, should be a moment of persuasion. So let's talk about how we persuade in our writing. If I had to boil down what persuasion is, I would boil it down to these three things. Like literally, I think this captures everything. You want to accentuate the positive, facts and law. Minimize the negatives. We don't eliminate, sorry, Johnny Mercer. <laughs> we don't eliminate the negatives, but we minimize them because we have that ethical duty to deal with those negative things. And then we tell a story. That's literally it. If you use various rhetorical devices to achieve those things, you have served your client well. Accentuate the positive, minimize the negative, tell a story. So let's talk about how we can use different aspects of our writing to accentuate and to minimize. We'll get to story at the end. So first, we wanna persuade through the organization at various points in our writing from the overall level of organizing the entire document down to discrete issues, so IRAC or CREAC, down to paragraphs and sentences. So let's talk about how we persuade through organization. The key principle here, uh, principles are those of primacy and recency. So let's spend a moment explaining what those are. Primacy is a concept that says the first thing that human beings read, see, taste, smell, experience, watch, is the thing that sticks in their mind most of anything else. That's primacy, okay? Think about the best novels that you've read. They have to catch you in those opening paragraphs or we're done and we put it down and we never read it again. So primacy is the first thing, the thing that leads is the thing that catches our attention most. Writing, spoken, doesn't matter. Recency is second only to the position of primacy, things that are at the end of a unit. So the last thing we see, read, hear, smell, taste, experience, sticks in our mind most, except for that which we, we saw first. So whenever I talk about primacy and recency, that's what I mean. And this means, and listen carefully to this, that these positions at the beginning of a unit of writing and at the end of the unit of writing are places of memory, power, and persuasion. This could be of a document. This could be of a, a section. This could be of a paragraph. And this can be of a sentence. To diminish something and minimize it, we put it in the middle. The eye does not focus as much and the brain doesn't retain as much that which is in the middle, especially when it's stated blandly. So as an officer of the court, we have the ethical duty to deal with adverse binding authority, we'll talk about that at the end, and negative facts. We have to, but the way we do it matters. And placement in the middle of a unit of writing is a great choice for things that are adverse. So let's talk about particular instances of this. So when I'm considering my document as a whole, um, in most of the documents I used to write for, you know, helping my judges draft their opinions or in practice, um, MSJs and opinion letters and so forth, I usually had multiple issues. So I'm just going to make up a situation and say there are three different issues. So again, applying that construct of primacy, I generally want to lead with that which is strongest. So whatever of those is strongest procedurally, substantively, is something that will really sway the court, I usually want to lead with that issue first. So I'm gonna call that number one. You also want to end strong. Now by this, I don't mean that you put your second most powerful argument or issue at the end so that it's one, three, two, no. First is one, then is your next, then is your third, barring certain six situations I'll talk about in a minute. What I mean is that overarching conclusion to your motion or brief should be a place of power and memory. So I always knew that if I was up against a word count back in the day for me, it was page limit. Um, I would sacrifice that final conclusion. It might just be a sentence that says, for these reasons, appellant respectfully requests, right? So I cordially invite you not to do that. And I cordially invite you to save on word count elsewhere so that you can have an impactful final conclusion. Why? Because of recency. You've got to get your story and persuasively phrased short gist of what you've just talked about. Something that will really catch the judge's eye 
in that overarching conclusion. Absolutely. Now that default order of leading with the strongest, I have here a note about caveat. Sometimes we can't do that in our motion or brief, right? Sometimes we have to deal with something first and get it out of the way. And so of course, in that situation, if I have to deal with something else first, I do. So what do I mean? So I mean situations that, for example, there might be a procedural or jurisdictional threshold issue. And if I don't answer that first, the court's gonna be thinking, how do I have jurisdiction, right? Why aren't you talking about that? And so they're not gonna hear your beautiful uh, substantive argument. So sometimes we have to take it out of this order simply because there's a practical reason. Other times there are contingent issues. If and only if one is true, then we get to issue two. So use your brain in it, um, you know, engage your brain as I tell my students, but by and large, you wanna lead with your strongest and have a strong conclusion. And let's talk about individual arguments and issues. So you want to, again, start in your analysis, which is going to be multiple paragraphs. Um, when you're analyzing an issue, you want to start substantively with what supports your thesis, either how you meet the burden of the applicable test or if you're defending against a motion or a brief, how the other side fails to do it. You with me? So start with the positive argument or position that supports your overarching thesis for your client. That takes advantage of primacy. Then briefly and blandly raise the adversary's position in the middle. Sometimes it's just very subtly done, very short, and then quickly refute it. And the refutation of it, if you think about it, when you put that together with the negative, this is what my husband loves to say, I'll, I'll attribute this to him. Why we win first, why they lose second. The focus in that second cluster will be on the rebuttal of the counter position. And the counter position draws less attention because it is in the middle of that cluster of paragraphs. Does that make sense? Pro, con, pro response hugely important. I would also say, I, I have students ask me, so if I'm the first to speak, if I'm the movement in a motion or the appellant in an appellant's brief, why on earth would I want to anticipatorily raise my opponent's argument, right? Why don't I just give all the positive stuff for mine and then wait till the reply brief to deal with refuting what they say? So very, very practical reasons. First, it's gonna look like you're hiding those negative things and you know, it's, that, that's not gonna sit well with the court. <laughs> Second, doing that allows your opponent to own their counter argument. But if you deal with it proactively and as a preemptive matter, you can own it in your own language and then pull the rug out from under it. Hugely important strategically. It also just gives you an air of, you know, honesty and openness. You know, here I admit there's this thing, but here's why this thing's not a deal break. Does that make sense? Why we win, why they lose that order. So um, to channel Tom Lehrer, this is a participatory class. And those who don't participate get to stay after class and clean the erasers. And it, you're probably not old enough to get that. I am. But anyway, <laughs> the bottom line is I want you to open up your chat function. So go ahead and open it up. And I want you to read example A and example B, and I want you to type in A or B, whichever you think is the stronger, the more persuasive. So in this scenario, we are analogizing to case X in favor of our client, Imara. So which is the more persuasive, A or B? Go. Keep them coming. Okay, so we've got a few answers here. And I think the consensus among those who have answered is column A has the more persuasive example. So let's break that apart. Ah, it's not letting me do um, my highlighting functions, but um, I'm going to just sort of walk through why I think A is stronger than B. 
So I think there are two main reasons that A is stronger than B. First, if I'm analogizing to case X, so case X is supportive, I want to lead with how that case actually supports my client's position. And so on the left, in the second sentence, you see, importantly, Imara has some of the exact symptoms the case of X plaintiffs did. You with me? So there's my pro-client analysis, my pro-client analogy. Much more satisfying because it takes that position of primacy. On the right-hand side, what I have is a confession of something negative, and I put that in a place of primacy, right? And so by putting my opponent's position, what will be their position in a place of primacy, I've actually highlighted it. And it's a little confusing for the reader, right? If we're analogizing to a case, we want to lead with why the analogy holds water. Second, look how example A begins. It has something that has no equivalent in example B. In example A, it says case X supports Imora's claim. This is an example of a thesis sentence. It tells me, it telegraphs two things to the readers. First, this is going to be an analogy. So I've just set out what case X is. I've just illustrated it, as we say in our classes. And now I'm telling the reader not only that there's going to be an analogy, but what the result of the analogy is, right? That's a thesis sentence. In contrast, in example B, the reader has to go through an entire paragraph to figure out what the result of the comparison is. See how helpful that thesis sentence is? Second, on the left-hand side, and although Imara has fewer and somewhat different symptoms from there, she nonetheless, do you see how quickly that counterposition is dealt with? It's even put in a subordinate clause about which we will speak in a minute. But let me just say as a preview, when we put things in a subordinate clause, despite, although, nevertheless, right, or nonetheless, when we put them in a subordinate clause, it subordinates them in our mind and it actually diminishes them. So this is a really good way to introduce this suspected counterposition. Like I'm anticipating the other side is going to try and distinguish case X on this basis. So I put it in the middle of the paragraph, which minimizes it, and I put it in a subordinate clause. Very subtle, right? But very effective. Okay, let's go ahead and move. Okay, so I can also um, persuade by organization on a smaller scale than that. So sentences, paragraphs, sections. So again, accentuate and minimize, right? Accentuate the positives, minimize the negatives. So to accentuate, I put things, as I just said, in the main clause. And we saw a really good example of this. Let me back up. In this middle sentence, right? And although Imara has Here's the main clause. She nonetheless has sufficient physical manifestations. When you read this sentence, you look at the second half naturally, don't you? That really sticks in your mind. That's because it's a main clause. The stuff in the subordinate clause is subordinated. Again, primacy and recency. I put information at the beginning and end of a paragraph or a sentence. It stands out. In the middle, it diminishes. And also short, direct sentences really catch the eye. You see the words, but dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's because if you have too many short sentences side by side, it gets a little choppy and distracting. So vary your sentence length, but by the same token, if you really want to emphasize something, make it short. Okay, so let's take a quick look at an example, A and B, and I want you to open up that chat function again. You represent Ms. Moore in a DWI case. So she's being prosecuted for DWI. So which is the more persuasive, A or B? Go ahead and type it out in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I think we're reaching a consensus that B is better, right? Excellent. Thank y'all. Good. No one has to clean erasers. Awesome. Okay. 
So let's unpack this and see why. All right, let's look at the left-hand side. So we have to deal ethically as officers of the court and strategically we want to as well. We have to deal with the fact that our client had a 0.13 blood alcohol level, have to deal with it. That doesn't mean we wanna highlight it. So the problem with example A is that is two things. First, the very first sentence in the paragraph highlights that negative fact. It's short, it's succinct, and it stands out in a place of primacy. Second, um, what else am I gonna say? So primacy in short. So you do see the rest of it that follows, but my brain is already focused on how she, you know, had a 0.13 blood alcohol level. Look at the rest of the sentence. So in the middle of that sentence, after nonetheless, you have, she did not exhibit outward signs of intoxication. So that's great, that's favorable for us, but it's jammed in the middle of those two sentences. And it's also not the first word of the sentence. And so it's diminished in our mind. And then the examples of having, you know, the things that she didn't have, we have to get those out. But the last words that you see are smelling of alcohol <laughs> in a place of recency, not as effective. In contrast, let's look at the right-hand side more lacked outward signs. Right away, we have that favorable conclusion that we want the court to draw. Look where, in the middle of the sentence, that's where the negative fact comes. And it comes in a subordinate clause, despite her blood alcohol level. And look at the end of the sentence. Her speech was clear instead of slurred speech. Pretty strong, isn't it? Really good taking advantage of primacy, recency, and middle. So this kind of thing, I'm not gonna lie. This takes time to craft. It really takes intentionality. I used to tell my students that at a minimum at the court, if I had the time, I would do no fewer than three full editing rounds for each document that I gave to a judge. I would sleep on it for at least one of those. And I looked for, I had a checklist. Here are the things for which I'm looking. Have I used primacy right? Have I used this right, right? So this takes time and it takes practice, but it is achievable. And what a thing of beauty that is, isn't it? Subtle persuasion. Okay. We can also persuade through language choice. So accentuate and minimize. So to accentuate, I wanna use more vivid language because it paints a, a, a picture in the mind's eye. And to minimize, I wanna use blander language. I will have a more robust discussion. I may take a few sentences instead of one, if, if it's needed, to talk about things that are favorable and less detailed and shorter of those negative things that I have an ethical duty to talk about, but I don't really want to highlight. Affirmative phrasing, I'll show you an example of that. Affirmative phrasing usually is something that catches the eye and accentuates more, and, and we'll see an example. Um, and then active versus passive voice. So I am not a hater of passive voice. When you need it, you need it. But it's longer and eats up your word count. And we'll see an example in a minute. And if you really wanna emphasize something, you put it in active voice. And by the way, you can have the most vivid language if you use active voice instead of passive. So let's look at a couple of examples. So let's take a look at these, affirmative and negative phrasing. The trial court properly denied Abdullahi's motion for summary judgment, as opposed to the trial court did not err in denying Abdullahi's summary judgment motion. On the right-hand side, our brain doesn't process those negative words as much. What really stands out is err, which is the opposite of what we want. So if it's possible to phrase something in the affirmative with a vivid verb, or, or verb string, like properly deny, go for it. That's usually the more preferred. Now let's take a look at active versus passive. So again, I'm not a hater of passive voice. It depends on whether you want to accentuate or you want to diminish. So here, imagine this is in a medical malpractice case and you're writing some kind of brief or motion or response. So if I'm the plaintiff, I like active voice. And in fact, I might say the hospital staff mistakenly did da 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 da. But that active voice puts the hospital staff as the subject of the sentence in a place of primacy. And therefore, 
The emphasis is on those who did the act. Plaintiff is gonna write that sentence. In contrast, the hospital might use passive voice for this negative fact that they have an ethical duty to get out. A mistake was made, right? Now, mistake is the focus, but it kind of softens who did it, right? <laughs> so, I, and you know, even if you include by the hospital staff, right? So it's a little bit softer. Again, very subtle moments of persuasion. And then we can also persuade based on um, choosing precise language, very intentionally. So let's take a look at these three sentences. Michael said, he threw the first punch. Michael's admitted and Michael's confessed. So they all convey roughly similar information it's just that if I'm representing Michaels as the criminal defendant for, you know, assault, I probably like Michaels said better because it's blander, right? If I'm the state, if I'm prosecuting it, I kind of like Michaels confessed. Again, that's that vivid active verb to highlight. Does that make sense? So it's at all levels, document, section, paragraph, sentence, and word choice that we persuade. Okay, so let's talk last about how to persuade through a favorable story. And then after this section, we'll go right to our ethics, which I know everyone is excited about. So I am too, actually. I love CLEs that have ethics. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. So remember, accentuate the positive, minimize the negative, and tell a story. So let's talk about what I mean when I say tell a story, because we're not speaking to a jury, y'all. That's a different skill. We're speaking to a single justice at the trial level or a panel of justices at the appellate level, right? So we're speaking to justices who are a little more, uh, they're more interested in the law and not passion so much. That said, they are human beings and they are swayed by knowing that they're making the right choice as well. And so we want to make sure that our story or theme comes across. So what do I mean by story or theme? All that I mean is you take some aspect of whatever the issue or the cases that's involved in that motion or that appeal, some aspect of that test that applies, right? That's favorable for your position. It might be an element. It might be an argument among multiple arguments, right? It might be overall another way of saying we carried our burden of proof. Whatever that legal idea is, that you want to emphasize, you distill it using rhetorical devices into a picture that you paint, okay? So it is a mini picture in the mind's eye, a mini picture using language that conveys whatever that really persuasive thought is you want to convey, all right? So it's just painting a picture. That's all it is, okay? So what are the criteria for choosing a good story or theme? I have one of my, my first judge for whom I worked at the first court of appeals, now retired. And the reason I write the way I do is Justice Marie B. Cohen. Wonderful, wonderful human being, excellent judge. So he spoke, used to speak to my classes about this. And he said, you know, really there are just two criteria for a theme. First, it has to be something that everyone can sink their, that the listener, the reader can sink their teeth into. Something that they're going to understand and connect with, right? Second, it needs to tie in to your legal theory. In other words, it has to be relevant to whatever element or component of the rule you're trying to promote. And I'll give you an example in a minute. So it's got to be something that they can connect with, right, and understand. And it's also got to be something that connects to your legal test. So what are my sources for themes? So I would say if I had to give you three examples with most bang for the buck, I would say that there are three really. So sometimes people like to use some kind of Jungian big picture, you know, concept as their theme, right? Um, so for example, the idea of justice or fairness, right? And so that idea of fairness or justice or judicial economy, right? That might appear periodically throughout their document. And so if you have that kind of theme, as long as it ties into the claim or defense that you're pr propounding in that motion, then go for it, that's great. It's just that there are such cases don't always present those types of things. So another fruitful area for a theme is the purpose underlying the rule, the very rule that you're applying that applies in the case. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. 
I once saw a really effective appellate brief. It was an appellant's brief. And what happened in the trial court was a series of, um, from the appellant's perspective, um, very de uh, rulings that it disagreed with, and they were all in the context of discovery. So it had to do with the rules of civil procedure. And um, the appellant's position was it was an abuse of discretion to grant these. And what the, what the writer did was they went to, I think it's rule one of the rules of civil procedure, and it literally says what the purpose of the rule is. The purpose of the rules is to promote fairness, no gotchas, but fairness. So fairness became their thing. Why? Because it was literally the purpose of the rules. That picture they coupled with the specific legal arguments showing why it was an abuse of discretion and unfair. Does that make sense? So that's another fruitful area. And other times our theme is just an aspect of the rule we want to highlight and why we win on it. So um, for example, uh, well, I'll show you an example in a minute. I'll show you an example in a minute. But basically, if I think breach is really important, then the idea of they didn't pay attention, right? That might be my theme. I might phrase it that way. I might articulate it in multiple ways, but that idea is going to appear multiple places in my document. So I would use a theme as often as I can, okay? Not hokey, but just very subtly. That picture, I would paint it in my statement of facts. I would paint it in my introduction in a trial motion and my um, uh, summary of the argument in an appellate brief. I would weave it into my analysis, particularly at the beginning and the end in those places of primacy and recency. And you want it also to have a nice place in the overarching conclusion. So let's uh, have an example here. So here's an example of a very neutral statement of facts. I love this, it's from Richard Newman and Sheila Simon. Take a moment to read this. Okay, so it's neutrally written, right? Now, of course, our statement of facts in any document can have no argument, absolutely none. I would say no inferences from facts. That's for your analysis. That doesn't mean that you sacrifice persuasion. This does not tell a story. It is neutral. And here's the litmus test, y'all. If you can take that statement of facts and put it in a blank document, and if you were to hand it to someone who doesn't know the case and say, who wrote this, the movement or the non-movement, the appellant or the appellee, and they can't tell you, that's a do-over, that's a mulligan. You gotta redo it. Okay, I want you to close your eyes, promise me you'll close your eyes, and I'm gonna read you what Newman and Simon have as a persuasive, theme-filled statement of facts with no argument. The climate in Death Valley is one of the hottest and driest known. The highest temperature recorded each summer reaches at least 120 degrees, and in many years, at least 125 degrees. The highest temperature recorded in Death Valley, 134 degrees, is also the second highest recorded on Earth. Rainfall is only one and a half inches per year, the lowest in the Western Hemisphere, and in a few years, no rain falls at all. In the summer sun in Death Valley, a person can lose on average about four gallons of perspiration per day. After about two gallons are lost, that person can become delirious and, if the lost water is not quickly replaced, die of dehydration. The defendant advertised himself as a professional and experienced backcountry guide. Relying on that, the plaintiffs hired him. He then took them into Death Valley for a full day hike in July with a quart of water each. Open your eyes. <clears throat> Am I right? No argument, none. But you know in the depths of your soul that it's the plaintiff's counsel who wrote this. Why? Because they used rhetorical devices to make it persuasive in a subtle way. Primacy, they began with the, the heat facts that were evidenced in the motion's uh, um, uh, appendices and its evidence. Ended, recency, with how the defendant did this. And you know what the theme is here? The theme is breach. That's the theme. 
It's madness to do this. Two gallons of water or two quarts of water each, that's nuts. But you don't get there unless you have the other stuff first. The theme focuses around the element of breach. That's all it is. That's masterful, isn't it? That's a thing of beauty, y'all. Okay, let's do our ethics corner, shall we? So I'm super excited to talk about these things. I love it because I don't normally get to um, outside of my class. So uh, I have three different slides with three different documents, three different um, sets of standards and rules of conduct that I want to share with you. And uh, I, I really just sort of want to highlight certain things about them. So this comes from, and, and by the way, all of these apply to legal writing. And we kind of danced about some of them before. So Texas Disciplinary Rule of Professional Conduct, that's a mouthful, 3.03a. So it has uh, multiple subsections, but one and four is what I really want to draw your attention to. So a lawyer shall not knowingly. So this is in our candor to the tribunal. And let me just back up a minute. As attorneys, we wear multiple hats. First, we're a representative for our client and a zealous advocate. But second and equally, right, we are also an officer of the court. So we owe candor to the tribunal. And third, we actually have a role in um, the public community. So advocating for the poor, doing pro bono services, um, working, striving to, you know, for fair laws. These are all things in different hats that lawyers wear. This is talking about the hat of officer of the court. A law lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a tribunal or, and this is key, fail to disclose to the tribunal authority in the controlling difference, so the jurisdiction, so binding authority known to the lawyer to be directly adverse to your client's position and not disclosed by opposing counsel. What does this mean? This means that if case X is controlling, in other words, binding, and it is directly adverse to my client's position and my opponent doesn't raise it, I have no choice but to raise that with the court. That's my ethical duty. If it's not binding, different question. If it's binding, it is. That doesn't mean we hang up our hat of advocacy, right? We still represent our client zealously. So we use those rhetorical devices, those techniques to deal with that adverse authority and to try and distinguish that adverse authority or explain to the judge why it doesn't apply perhaps or that it should be interpreted in a way that's less harsh or favorable even, as long as it's within the bounds of reason and supportable, right? But we can't just ignore it, even if our opposing counsel does, hugely important. So that's what I'll say about uh, rules of disciplinary conduct. Um, yeah, so you can see the URL to it. You can find it on the Texas Bar website. So the Texas Lawyer's Creed is actually a, a real thing of beauty. I really like the Texas Lawyer's Creed. If you haven't read the whole thing, I would, I would read it, right? Um, so you can, it's, it was adopted by the Supreme Court of Texas and the Court of Criminal Appeals in 1989. And it was in response to a bunch of what we used to call when I was you know, in school and out of school Rambo tactics. So very aggressive, you know, adversarial tactics that not everyone, but a minority of attorneys were doing, and it was just, it made litigation unpleasant. It was uh, just unsupportable. And so um, Justice Eugene Cook was instrumental in putting together a committee to look at actually coming up with a lawyer's creed about professionalism. Again, talking about professionalism, you know, the lawyer's relationship with the client, the lawyer's relationship with the court, and so on and so forth. You can visit the center, uh, Texas Center for Legal Ethics for more information about the Texas Lawyers Creed. You can see the URL at the bottom. Um, you can also, uh, well, I would say that primarily. So I wanted to read you the, um, the preamble of the Texas Lawyers Creed. I am a lawyer. I am entrusted by the people of Texas to preserve and improve our legal system. I am licensed by the Supreme Court of Texas. I must therefore abide by the Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct, but I know that professionalism requires more than merely avoiding the violation of laws and rules. I am committed to this creed for no other reason than that it is right. Unlike the disciplinary rules, these are enforced as aspirational measures, 
So primarily through voluntary compliance, but also through peer pressure and public pressure. And only in the last instance can courts use their inherent authority to regulate things or other rules to try and enforce these. You heard that preamble. We as officers of the court have the duty to really, I mean, these things are floors we want to go to the ceiling, right? So one of the things that I've highlighted here is section six of article four, which deals with lawyer and judge. And again, we want to make sure that we are doing the utmost that we can to represent our profession favorably in all things. And one of them is this, I will not knowingly misrepresent, mischaracterize, misquote, or miscite facts or authorities to gain an advantage. So just as one example, if I'm talking about a case with the court in my document, I'm illustrating the case, for example, I can't leave out facts of the case that were controlling in that case, that were material in that case, just because they're adverse to my client. So that is, in effect, misrepresenting the authority or at least not being fully transparent. On a practical level, judges remember that, <laughs> but on an ethical level, we don't want to do that. Again, we don't eliminate the negative. We minimize it with rhetorical devices and with strategies, but we must deal with it. And we must be upfront about the negative facts in the case, about negative facts and precedent, and about negative precedent that's binding. So I, I really recommend this. And by the way, the lawyer's creed itself calls upon us to share the creed with our clients. We should be sharing this with our clients so that they can see how we are operating. And then finally, the Supreme Court of Texas Standards for Appellate Conduct. I am actually gonna type into the chat right now. Let's see if it'll let me do it. Yes, here we go. So this is um, an article that was written by 13th Court of Appeals Justice uh, Benavides and Joshua Caldwell. And it went through and sort of explained the history of the, the Supreme Court of Texas Standards for Appellate Conduct. And it gives um, commentary on each of the provisions, which I think is really, really helpful. It's only about three years old, so it's very current. Okay, so um, section paragraphs three and four under, again, lawyer's duties to the court, Counsel should not misrepresent, mischaracterize, misquote, or miscite the factual record or legal authority. So very much like the Texas Lawyer's Creed. And then very much like the disciplinary rules, number four, if there's binding adverse authority, we have to confess that, confess that to the court. But then we deal with it, right? We deal with it as an advocate zealously uh, promoting our client's interest. Um, like the other uh, lawyer's creed, this one is sort of self and, you know, it's voluntarily enforced, but it's also enforced by peer pressure among attorneys and by the public. I think what I wanted to say on this is actually it has a bit of an interesting history. It was adopted by the Supreme Court in 1999. Uh, actually, it um, was the brainchild of the appellate section of the State Bar of Texas. And so they're the ones that started it. And I believe that Texas is the first jurisdiction to have adopted these kinds of standards. So we're first in this, y'all. It's a really beautiful document as well. And just like the Lawyer's Creed advises us that we should give that copy to our clients in that situation, this also advises us that we should give this to our appellate clients when they engage us. They should see what we hold ourselves to. So um, I think that is everything, my friends. Let me see. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions that people have. Um, I think they could be put in the chat, Daniel, am I correct? Yes, uh, if anybody has any questions, that'd be great if you could put it in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put the CLE number in the chat so if you all can take a look at that. We wanna thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Simpson. It's my pleasure. You can tell I get a little excited about this topic. <laughs> Are there, if there are any questions I can answer, please go ahead and type them in the chat. My pleasure, y'all. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> Definitely. For me, for me, it was. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I... 
I still have, when I write, I still, now it's a mental checklist, but I still have a checklist of all this stuff because it's, we become so familiar with our writing, Daniel, that when we get to the point of editing, we don't see it clearly. We don't see it as our reader would see it. And so that's why the council to sleep on it at least one night and come back to it with fresh eyes. But having a checklist about, have I used primacy right? Have I used recency right, right? Have I been as clear as, have I connected all those dots? Have I used the core language of the rule, right? Have I done why we win, why they lose, right? Um, having that at least mentally, if not physically, is, is hugely important. Definitely. And that, I mean, that, that's some of the best advice I got is, you know, don't wait until the last day to start whatever it is, you know, calendar it a day or two before it's actually due. And then you have time to actually sit down and edit it. Unlike uh, some people are more comfortable just doing it the day of firing it off. And then, you know, when they get a response, they realize that they should have been edited maybe a little better. <laughs> You know, it's always a balance too, isn't it, Daniel, right? Like we don't have all the time in the universe, but by the same token, we do want to have something that's professional, especially when we're representing our firm or ourself uh, to a court um, to the greatest extent possible. And of course, sometimes we have to do triage. That's just the nature of it. But the more you practice these things, the more they will come a second nature. And you, the faster you'll get at it so that you can actually, you know, get it done more quickly. <laughs> so my students ask me all the time, for our graded memo, how long would this take you? I was like, well, after I'd been on the court for 13 years, I would say maybe a day. But for you, it's three weeks, honestly. So. <laughs> well, three days. All right. Well, I think there may not be any questions. So I just want to thank you all again for letting me talk about something near and dear to my heart. And you can see my contact information. If anyone has further questions, please feel free to reach out. Yeah. Well, we, we just want to say thank you again so much for this fantastic presentation. We really appreciate the time you spent with us here today. So it's my um, pleasure. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see you back at Hila stuff, if not the evening with the judiciary, uh, another CLE coming up. Absolutely, absolutely. I, and may it soon be in person again. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All right, thank you, Daniel. Have a great rest of the day.